right, folks, we have heard it from many. We have said it a lot, how the role of the chief financial officer, the CFO, has really changed since the great financial crisis. And I, I would easily throw in the global pandemic. Uh, and what seems to be these nonstop stresses, whether it's market, political, and economic dynamics that Tim continue to change. So it's why we here at Bloomberg have amped up our coverage of the key member of the C-suite, the CFO. We cover it weekly in the Bloomberg CFO briefing newsletter. It comes out on Sunday. It's going to focus on earnings guidance, the importance of beat and raise in the current economic environment. Also highlight individuals, including Carol Levi's CFO, Harmeet Singh. Yeah, you got, you had a really good conversation. I missed it yesterday. By the way, you can sign up uh, for the Bloomberg CFO Briefing Newsletter. Find it at Bloomberg.com slash account slash newsletters slash CFO slash briefing or hyphen briefing, I should say, CFO hyphen briefing. Let's get to it with Bloomberg News Senior Editor Nina Trentman. She's here in our studio. Hey, Nina. Um, yeah. It is interesting to see how the CFO has gone, I feel like go back maybe a few decades ago, and it was just they'd pop in on the earnings call and make some comments and then kind of go away. It felt that way. Um, but since GFC, the great financial crisis, since the global pandemic, since a lot of things, uh, it feels like that they definitely have a front seat um, at the table when it comes to corporate strategy. But tell us a little bit more about the vision that you guys have been doing at the CFO briefing newsletter here at Bloomberg. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, as you say, like the CFO is and has become much more strategic in recent years. And so I think from our perspective here at Bloomberg, of course, that's something that we want to reflect in our coverage. Um, these people, the CFOs, they take strategic decisions, they allocate billions of dollars of capital. They're oftentimes the closest to actually what's going on in their businesses because they see all the numbers they're forecasting on a regular basis. So if you really want to know what's going on inside a company, then nowadays I often think like you should talk to a CFO and not necessarily always to the CEO who gives you the big strategic talk. Um, the newsletter comes out every Sunday, as you pointed out, um, and we're trying to basically sort of um, combine both reporting on what CFOs are doing, plus also write a little bit about what's going on in the world that is also important for CFOs, given that these people also, of course, are curious to see what else is happening with that, that we need to know. Nina, does it seem to you that CFOs are increasingly visible too? Like they're making more of an appearance on earnings calls, they're doing more press. Um, they're not, you know, in the basement with a calculator looking at spreadsheets. <laughs> well, yeah, there's this, this famous image of the CFO being the bean counter. Yeah. Whenever you say that to a CFO, they say, no, 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 that's not who we are. I have and people they, count the beans for me. Right, but to, and I have AI doing that for me these days. <laughs> but no, I think what you're right. Like, we're seeing CFOs being more visible. Of course, some companies are more, more so than others, um, but certainly sort of playing this role of the number two behind the CEO. We're also increasingly seeing CFOs taking on the, the CEO role later. So I think like it's sort a of, pipeline now. It's a bit of a pipeline, yes. And it's also the oftentimes if, if a company, for example, loses their CEO, suddenly then oftentimes the CFO would step in because coming back to what we talked about they earlier, know the business, they, right? they know the business, they know the numbers, they also know where all the corpses are buried if there are any. So right. they're basically very knowledgeable about what's going on in the I, business. As you well know, as we uh, know that we are in the thick of earnings season, right? We highlighted Netflix at the top of the show, but this has been a very busy week um, for earnings, certainly when the big uh, when it comes to some of the big cap names. You guys in the newsletter are talking about earnings guidance. You're talking about the importance of being raised. Uh, you know, we kind of joke, uh, not a joke, of how, you know, we continue to be managed when it comes to earnings. But <laughs> what is it that you guys got into? It feels like it. It does. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting this that, um, of course, companies put out guidance because they want to give some sense as to what to expect. They want to manage expectations that investors, analysts, journalists have, but also so, of course, they are putting themselves in a, in a bit of a box when they do that because right. they give a range and they have to make sure that they're managing the business towards that. And whilst, of course, you can make sure that you're getting to your numbers by cutting, cutting costs or doing other short-term things in order to get to your strategy, you need to basically be, be a good steward of, of your business. And so I've actually been finding uh, guidance a super interesting topic, specifically when it comes to then this trend, um, which we are often seeing with tech companies, but also with our, others around beat and raise and, and companies being proud about the fact that they did that. Interestingly enough, if you look at academic research, um, mm. we clearly see that since about 2010 or so, there's more companies that are able to not just beat, but also raise. Whereas before, it was more of a mixed picture between sort of about roughly the same cohort of companies that would beat as well as the ones that would miss. And so I think what it huh. tells us is that companies are becoming better at 
a being more realistic about their their capabilities but also of course if you want to sort of spin it the other way being better at managing expectations so how much of a cfo's job and look it has to be a gross generalization because not every company is the same and every you know this is not a monolith that we're talking about here but how much of a cfo's job is about managing wall street and wall street's expectations Probably a pretty big part of the job. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Great it's answer. pretty, 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 um, pretty substantial. Um, of course, for all publicly traded businesses, in the end, it's not just the numbers, but also how are they being received. And I think the interesting thing is about if you look at guidance, is this that in the end. It really speaks closely to how is a company budgeting, how is it forecasting, does it really know what's going on inside its business, which comes back to that point that we had earlier. And um, if you remember a few weeks ago when uh, Stellantis, for example, ousted mm -hmm. its CFO, mm -hmm. we had this interesting situation where the CFO was one week before saying, oh yeah, something like one of the goals wouldn't be a walk in the park, and then the company put out a huge profit warning, which in itself is bad, but also is bad because you have been telegraphing something to your market and unfortunately reality is catching up with you, which is of course as a CFO, you want to avoid that. Well, because it can lead to shareholder lawsuits, right? Potentially if you're saying something that's very different, possibly. Sure, sure. Like yeah. on the extreme end, it can end in that. On the on on in not ex so extreme cases, it can end in companies just l not meeting their targets and, and there being a share price loss. So yeah. You want to be on point. Absolutely. Okay, we mentioned Levi's CFO included in our newsletter on uh, included in your newsletter on Sunday. He was a guest on Business Week yesterday. Um, here's Levi's CFO Harmeet Singh on Bloomberg Business Week. When we guided Core Four, when we talked about a sequential progression, you know, our, our belief is the brand continues to grow. Uh, to your question about tariffs, um, um, a couple of years ago, uh, we were importing uh, uh, from China into the U.S about 15, 16 percent of the product. Um, over the years, we've scaled that down. So the imports into the U.S. from China is about, uh, about a percentage Where are you point. going instead? And because we have a supply chain, we're able to cross-source it across different geographies. So, you know, we've been able to cross-source it from other countries in Asia. I mean, think Vietnam, think Bangladesh, think uh, Pakistan. And that's really what's really helped us. Uh, the cross-sourcing strategy, beside the fact that we're not concentrated significantly in any one country makes a difference. That was Harmeet Singh, CFO of Levi's. I asked him about the potential for Trump tariffs if Trump wins again, and he was talking, Nina, just about all the just changes they've had, they made in recent years to source from different countries rather than just China. Yeah, and actually, that is, of course, a super interesting thing if you're a retailer and you uh, sort of selling all around the world, of course, sort of adding tariff costs is, is driving up your costs quite significantly. Harmit, of course, is also an interesting CFO because also he's the chief growth officer of the company, which is um, quite a rare combination of roles, but also then sort of talks, I think, to this point about tariffs. Got he's it. also focused on gold, on growth. All right, Nina, thank you so much. Check out the newsletter coming out on Sunday. Coming up next, Options Insight. This is Bloomberg. In case you missed it, our latest Business Week podcast features Dan Morgan, senior portfolio manager at Synovus Trust. He broke down Netflix earnings as they were crossing. Download it now at Bloomberg.com or wherever you get your podcasts.